I believe we should start the session. Ritin, can you please introduce our uh, our guest and uh, an honor for uh, for us to uh, to have Dr. Urban. Uh, can you please introduce Dr. Urban to the congregation, please? Pleasure, pleasure is all mine, Gavin. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm uh, welcome again and good evening. I believe you all have come from the break that we have given. So, this is one of the most anticipated and uh, most awaited session for the day one of this Data Science Congress virtual, which is happening. And we are glad that we have today with us the father of modern artificial intelligence, Dr. Ergen himself. So it's a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce him. And uh, he has been working for the last more than three decades, I would say, uh, in that space extensively in AI machine learning. These are his key areas. And he is the father of uh, modern artificial intelligence. And today the session would be all about that we all have seen and we have discussed earlier this coronavirus, the pandemic that had affected entire economy and the entire globe, and the, the, the coronavirus crisis has brought an unprecedented level of worldwide scientific collaborations. So uh, the today's session by Dr. Ergen is all about how AI based on neural networks, RNS, and deep learning is helping or can help to fight this pandemic, which is COVID-19. And I would also like to introduce uh, the moderator for the session, Mr. Bhupesh Dahiria himself. And he is the CEO of and the founder of MUNI Campus. And also he is the uh, managing trustee for Ages Knowledge Trust. May I please uh, request uh, Dr. Argan and um, so Dahiria to please turn on your videos and camera on and your audio on. So we'll start off with the session. Thank you so much. Hope that would be a great session. All of you will enjoy that. Thank you. Uh, please do it to the needful. Uh, please start uh, the, theme, the video. Organize us for the invitation to give a keynote here. It's a great honor. What you see behind me is a cartoon that I made for my little website on AI against the coronavirus just a few days ago. And much of what I'm going to tell you will be reflected in this website. Artificial intelligence based on deep neural networks and deep learning can help to fight the COVID-19 virus in many ways. The basic principle is very simple. Neural networks can learn to detect patterns in data from viruses, patients, others, and we can use those neural networks then to predict future consequences of possible actions, and we will act to minimize damage. And I'll mention a few examples. One can track populations through pattern recognition. Many of you probably know the Bluetooth peer-to-peer uh, -peer apps on your smartphone, uh, which allow you to prevent dangerous contacts to a certain extent. Not so much AI is needed for that. It is more challenging to recognize faces or gates of people uh, and their contacts in videos taken by drones or in the street. That's harder, but it's possible. And the ways of doing that actually go back a long time. In 2011, almost a decade ago, my brilliant postdoc, Dan Girejan, was the first to, um, to create a deep and fast neural network, which was able to win patent recognition competitions. And back then, a decade ago, for the first time, superhuman performance in computer vision was achieved in a contest in Silicon Valley. And much of modern computer vision is extending this approach. And especially in China, it's widely used today. Neural networks can also learn to predict outbreaks to build early warning systems. And there is a Kaggle COVID-19 forecasting challenge on that. And neural networks can also learn to predict future demand for limited resources, such as ventilators and doctors to optimize logistics. 
And you can call that predictive maintenance of the population, if you will. One can also sequence virus genomes, that's what's being done all the time, and predict where similar genomes are going to appear next. Because maybe you know that the virus genome is mutating all the time randomly, and that's how you can trace it back in time where it's coming from. And that's, that data can be fed into a systems that then learn to predict the future evolution, future expected evolution of these observations. Neural networks can also learn to monitor single patients. For example, they can monitor your heart rate and they can uh, track your biosignals, your breathing, your cuffs, and other signals. And my little website that I mentioned before has a bunch of references on recent applications of this to the coronavirus crisis. And neural networks can also analyze uh, images, such as X-ray images of uh, lungs or chests of patients, and they can diagnose pathologies. And again, my website has a bunch of references on that. By the way, the first medical imaging contest won by deep neural networks dates back to 2012. And again, it was my postdoc, Dan Girezan, and his colleagues and my little team. And this was on cancer detection. What you see behind me is a picture of the slice through a female breast. And some of these cells that you see there are harmless and others are dangerous. And normally it takes a trained histologist to tell the good ones from the bad ones. But in this contest, uh, we were able to teach a neural network to imitate the histologist. And that's how the system suddenly was able to outperform all these competitors. And today, everybody is doing this. Not only startups, but also the big companies such as Siemens and Google and IBM. This actually was part of our recent decade of deep learning. Between 2010 and 2020, computers suddenly were fast enough to allow commercial applications of all these techniques that we have developed a long time ago. And uh, much of that actually goes back to the early 90s. And I'm always um, claiming that we had this miraculous year in the, uh, the, the year 1990 to 1991, when many of the basic concepts that have become very popular later uh, were published for the first time, but computers were a million times slower than today, and nobody could do much with that. And this has greatly changed. Neural networks can also partially automate drug design, and I find this very exciting. For example, neural networks can help to find molecules that dock on the folded proteins of this virus. The virus is simple. It has just a few um, proteins, and the goal must be to inhibit the activity of these proteins, much like antibodies do, such that um, you can block the entire self-replication machinery of the virus. And already in 2007, when compute was almost 1,000 times more expensive than today, the deep neural network called long short-term memory, or LSTM, excelled at predicting protein folding. And this was done by my former student, but now a professor in Linz, Sepp Hochreiter, in 2007. And to predict folding like that is important for finding docking stations. Google DeepMind recently also had computational predictions of protein structures associated with the virus. By the way, the first deep minders with publications in AI and PhDs in computer science actually came from my little lab here in Switzerland. One of them was co-founder of the company and the other one the first employee. So what's this LSTM which I just mentioned, which has been so successful in predicting 
the folding of proteins in 2007. It's much older than 2007. It goes back also um, to the early 90s and it's a neural network, a recurrent neural network, a little bit inspired by the human brain. In the human brain, you've got um, maybe 100 billion little processors called neurons, and each of them is connected to maybe 10,000 other neurons. And some of these input, some of these neurons are input neurons where data is coming through the cameras and the microphones. And some of these neurons are output neurons and if they are switched on, then your finger muscles move or your speech muscles move. And your life is basically about translating these incoming inputs into actions, action sequences that lead to success. Now, all these connections have a little strength and it's called the weight. And in the beginning, all of these Weights are random, which means that the influence that one neuron onto another has is random too. But then through learning, some of these connections get stronger and some of them get weaker, such that in the end, the network can learn to do something interesting just by uh, following training examples. For example, it can drive a car or do speech recognition and stuff like that, or predict coronavirus folding, all kinds of things like that. And um, I don't have the time to go into the details of that. However, at least I can mention in the slide behind me the names of the brilliant students in my lab that have made, them, that, have made that possible. First of all, Sepp Hochreiter, my first student ever, already in 1991, he had fundamental insights uh, in his diploma thesis. And then Felix Geers uh, in, in my Swiss uh, lab already, not any longer at uh, Tech University Munich. And then Alex Graves, a Scottish guy who uh, also had great contributions. Dan Wierstra, Justin Bayer, and a couple of other important students who, who made LSTM what it is today. And what is this used for today? You don't know it so much from protein folding prediction. No, you know it from your smartphone because you have an LSTM on your, on your smartphone where it is doing much of the AI applications there. For example, speech recognition. Uh, since 2015, whenever you um, uh, interact with a search engine through the voice channel when you say, okay, Google, what is the shortest way to the station? Then it understands what you say and it uh, translates that into a um, query for the search engine. And it's much better than what they had before. And today that's on billions of smartphones. And also um, shortly after that, um, LSTM started to become really useful for translating from one language into another. And this is now also on many, many smartphones. By 2017, Facebook Translate already did about uh, 30 billion translations of messages through LSTM per week, 30 billion. If you compare that to the most successful YouTube video that has about 6 billion clicks, but it needed two years for that. So LSTM is useful for many uh, kinds of sequence processing. Protein folding is just one of these possible applications. However, back then, 2000, um, uh, 1991, when we started with this whole deep learning thing for recurrent networks, um, we could do only little toy experiments because computers were really a million times slower than they are today. Fortunately, however, every five years, computing became 10 times cheaper. And that's an old trend. It was even old in 1990 because it started at least way back in 1941 when this man, Konrad Zuse, built the first working program control general computer. That was between 1935 and 1941. And he, he could do roughly one operation per second. One operation per second like a, a single multiplication per second. But then 30 years later, you could do roughly 1 million operations like that for the same price. 
and so on. And today we can do roughly 1 million billion operations per second for the same price. And suddenly um, computers and smartphones and everything are powerful enough to, um, to really exploit the power of these old algorithms from the previous millennium. By 2009, computers were fast enough such for the first time uh, LSTM was able to win uh, pattern recognition competitions. Through the efforts of my previously mentioned PhD student Alex Graves, and, um, and then came our decade of deep learning where suddenly everybody started to use that, which makes me happy. It's really um, great to see that decades of research have eventually led to something that really influences billions of people all over the world and currently really can play a role in find, fighting the coronavirus. One can also teach chemistry to LSTM or to feed forward neural networks or to graph neural networks, uh, which were pioneered in 1995 by Goller and Küchler, the graph neural networks. How does that work? You have input substances and certain conditions such as temperature and catalyzers, and then a chemical reaction takes place and it produces outputs, output substances. And if you have a database with millions of examples like that, the network can learn to map these input ingredients to the corresponding output substances. And in the process, it learns about chemistry. And you can use it as a stand-in for what physics and chemistry really do, which means you can, once you have trained it on lots of examples, once you have made it um, an artificial chemist, you can use it to uh, come up with new um, compositions of ingredients to achieve new output substances that you never have seen in this way. For example, you have certain desired properties of the output substances and then you can um, work the neural network backwards and figure out which kind of input substances do I need, given this model of chemistry, to achieve these desired results. And the jaws of chemical engineers dropped when they saw how well this can work. In recent years, this really has started to revolutionize chemistry. And neural networks are now sometimes even good enough to replace wet lab tests, the so-called assays. Neural networks won already eight years ago the Merck Molecular Activity Challenge that was done by the University of Toronto. And uh, they also won the TOX21 data challenge on predicting the toxicity of substances. That was done by the University of Linz in uh, Hochreiter's group. Neural networks can design new molecules. Uh, for example, Segler and colleagues had a famous paper about that in 2018. And they also can find the antibody needle in an antibody repertoire haystack. That was again done by the University of Linz, which has a very strong bioinformatics group, which is using deep learning in many ways to, um, to improve the situation in chemistry, in um, drug design, and so on. For example, the ligand-based approach goes like this. Given a certain molecule, a neural network learns to predict to which proteins it will bind. Again, done by the University of Linz. And my uh, little website, AI versus COVID-19, has references on that. The typical drug discovery development pipeline takes too long. It takes at least six years for selecting maybe five out of 10,000 compounds. And it takes seven years of clinical trials afterwards um, where you then study just a few things that are very promising, and then it still takes one year or more of approval. And that's too long, especially at um, 
the times of the current pandemic. But one can speed this up by fast virtual screening. Use a large database, such as the Zinc database, which contains descriptions of maybe one billion molecules. And then pipe the data through a deep neural network called the SMILES LSTM. The SMILES LSTM, which also goes back to the University of Linz. And it suggested about 30,000 top scoring molecules as inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2, of this virus. And then once you have this greatly um, reduced set of candidates, you start testing in the wet lab. And you can also apply this approach to drugs, which are already on the market, which is important because that's the way to reduce these costly clinical trials. Just a few days ago, there was the JEDI challenge on that. On the 9th of April 2020, this grand challenge started, which is called a billion molecules against COVID-19. And there's two million euros price money on this. JEDI calls itself the European Moonshot Factory. And that's one of the first moonshots that they have there. Again, my little website, AI versus COVID, has links to many additional resources to help with COVID-19 research. Most of what I have been talking about so far is about supervised learning. However, we also have methods that don't slavishly imitate human teachers, but that create their own goals and that curiously explore the world like little babies do, like little scientists do. Little babies are little scientists and and they don't learn much from their parents. A little bit they learn from the parents, but much of what they learn is learned by inventing experiments with the toys. How do I um, change the inputs that are coming in through my actions in the real world? And that's how little babies learn by playing to understand gravity and other aspects of physics and so on. And since 1990, we've been working on uh, little artificial agents that really create their own experiments, self-invented experiments to create situations in the world from which they... So the basics of curious little babies are the same the same principles that we find in scientists 20 years later. And the only difference is that the experiments are becoming more expensive. And we have artificial scientists that are getting smarter and smarter in this way. And it may be too late uh, for the coronavirus, uh, which needs a very fast response. But the future is going to be about artificial scientists that creatively and curiously learn about the world by inventing their own goals and their own experiments. And in principle, we already know how to do that. Many people want to know how does COVID I should know because I have a startup called Nascence which is affected because our clients are affected. Uh, all the major companies in the world, all the famous uh, manufacturers of all kinds of devices are affected. However, as all the Chinese know well, a crisis is also an opportunity. And actually, the industry is going to emerge stronger from this crisis than it was before. Because the machines that they are using are going to become smarter and they will be able to do all kinds of things that they couldn't do before using artificial brains like the ones that we are constructing at Nascence. Nascence is pronounced like birth in English, like Nascence, 
but it's spelled in a different way. NN for neural networks, AI for artificial intelligence, and it's, it's about the birth of a general purpose neural network based artificial intelligence. Here are uh, some pictures taken with the guys that are collaborating with us in uh, several exciting projects, Audi, uh, Festo, and its robot hands, EOS, which is a leader in 3D manufacturing and 3D industrial uh, printing, SHOT, which is a leader in making glass, and maybe you have their glass in the lenses of your smartphones because they are owned by the Zeiss Foundation and Sulzer Schmid, which is using drones to inspect wind turbines without endangering any humans in the process. Let me finally emphasize that AI is for all. AI is not going to be dominated by just a few big companies. No, it's getting cheaper all the time. Every five years, it's getting 10 times cheaper, as I mentioned before, which means within 30 years, it's going to be a million times cheaper. It's going to make human lives longer and healthier and happier, and it has already started doing that. I remember 40 years ago, I had a rich friend. He owned a Porsche. But the most amazing thing was that in the Porsche, he had a mobile phone, which means he could talk to other guys who also had a Porsche like that while being on the road. It was the most incredible thing. Today, a few decades later, billions of people, also in developing countries, have smartphones that are much better than what he had back then. And the same is going to be true for AI. Everybody is going to have cheap AIs making his life better in many different ways. So in the end, all will be good. I started this talk with a cartoon of a robot and I will end it with the cartoon of a robot which I drew a long time ago, 33 years ago, one third of a century ago. You see it behind me. It's the cover of my diploma thesis from 1987. My diploma thesis was very ambitious. It was about building a machine that not only learns, but also learns to improve the way it learns, and learns to improve the way it learns, to improve the way it learns, and so on recursively. Meta-learning, this is called. And back then, few people were interested, but today it's a hot topic, and in many ways, it has defined my life since then. But that's not my final slide. My final slide is about something related to COVID, namely the coronavirus geopolitics. 100 years ago, the Spanish flu emerged, not from Spain, but apparently from North America, apparently from Kansas. A few months ago, COVID-19 emerged, apparently from China. Long before that, many centuries ago, germs and viruses and diseases went hand in hand with the fall and the rise of empires. And if you want to read a few thoughts on that, you have a look at this little web page that I made just for you. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Burgund, for such a wonderful video which you have recorded. And uh, I think even those who do not know about what is LSTM network, or maybe CNN or RNN, they must have got some idea. But to just sum up what uh, Dr. Hurgan has said in his uh, video, so Dr. Hurgan and his team, his students, uh, they have developed this LSTM network. And the LSTM network has revolutionized this uh, RNN. 
which eventually is used by google it is used by a city it is used by alexa every uh, translation language translation which you do it in google is uh, inherently uses lstm and thanks to you uh, professor jorgen hargan for uh, inventing uh, leading your team to really give this world this power of lstm network uh, we have couple of uh, interesting questions so let me take questions couple of questions from audience and then i'll ask you questions uh, one question vikram is ans asking how can neuroscience lead to further advancements in ai how can neuroscience lead to further advancements in ai i tend to answer questions like that um, as follows I don't think that at the moment neuroscience can contribute anything to AI research. There was a time when um, engineering and AI and neural network research was inspired by neuroscience, but that was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. 50 years ago, people like Fukushima were inspired by neuro neuroscientist uh, um, uh, research, and uh, they they re-implemented or at least um, implemented systems that were inspired by what Hubel and Wiesel found in the mammalian cortex. And back then, other people discovered that um, neurons are spiking and are very energy efficient as they are computing stuff, much more energy efficient than our um, GPUs, which we are currently using to train deep networks. However, uh, all of that is um, decades old and all the recent advances in deep learning in the past uh, 30 years or so have been driven by engineering and by mathematics. And you say, okay, what is the problem? Uh -huh. uh, can I formulate that in terms of um, an objective function? And can I derive from that objective function a learning algorithm that achieves whatever I want to achieve? And so, um, at the moment, we are in a situation where uh, artificial neural network scientists know no more about intelligence than uh, neuroscientists who are getting bogged down by all kinds of details, um, evolutionary ballast, for example, many neuroscientists know a lot about calcium channels, uh, which open up in a certain way in the synapses of human brains. And, and to know that is irrelevant for understanding the principles of intelligence, just like knowing the uh, detailed characteristic curve of a transistor is irrelevant for understanding um, the intelligence of your smartphone, which is using millions of uh, transistors. But um, to understand its intelligence, you have to understand that it's currently just sorting addresses. And to understand the nature of this procedure, you have to understand quicksort, which is a very short uh, three-line algorithm. And that is the language you have to use to think about intelligence and to make further progress, the language of programs and algorithms and objective functions. And neuroscientists, unfortunately, cannot contribute anything here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rogan, for uh, uh, responding to this question. Now, since morning, we have a couple of, a uh, lot of sessions around AI and dangers of the AI. And the AI has made machines uh, quite intelligent. And there was a morning session by Professor Toby about uh, the dangers of AI, because AI is powering robots. And uh, so currently, we're suffering with biological warning virus, the other is computer virus, which is again powered by AI. And now we are seeing the robots which can be a threat to humanity, not today, maybe tomorrow. So when this intelligence, machine intelligence actually takes over the human intelligence, because it's still machine intelligence, does not have that uh, the emotional aspect which human beings have. So what are your thoughts where these machine intelligence will really combine with the human emotions or sensitivity so that uh, AI can really take a proper call? 
and will not become a danger. Yeah. So first of all, I think that for decades, our artificial agents have had something like simple emotions. Right. And just as a byproduct of what they do, what do they do? They maximize reward. There's a field, an important field, which is called reinforcement learning. And what is it about? You have an agent, for example, a recurrent neural network drives the actions of an agent that is interacting with an environment. And then um, you get sometimes feedback from the environment in terms of reward. Maybe you have found food and that's good for you. So you have a reward signal. And what you're trying to do is maximize the sum of all these reward signals that you will get within your lifetime. And some of these reward signals are negative reward signals like pain signals. When you bump against an obstacle, you feel pain. And there's a good reason for that because your body and, and you as an agent, you have to be informed about the fact that there is something that's not good for you. And you have to invent, you have to get motivated to invent action sequences that lead you around these obstacles such that you don't bump against them any longer. And this whole um, um, a business of maximizing reward is in many ways creating behavior that um, corresponds to emotion. For example, suppose a little robot is learning using a reward maximization and there's a guy and whenever the guy comes into the door, he walks up to the robot and knocks it on the head. And then the robot will get negative reward and it will say, okay, um, I have to figure out how to uh, avoid that. And then next time um, the guy comes in, maybe the robot is already smart enough to do some face recognition. He says, oh, that's my, my enemy. And he will try to hide behind the curtain. And you look at the behavior of this guy and you say, this little guy has fear, which is an emotion. And it's just a very natural consequence of maximizing this objective function uh, of reward. And so you, once you have something, once you have reward maximization, you get all kinds of secondary emotions. For example, these learning algorithms, they learn to predict bad things or good things long before they happen. So next time the, the door goes up, um, without the guy really having knocked the robot, the robot will already anticipate that something bad is going to happen. And so long before it happens, it will act to, to avoid that. And it will just exhibit all the signs that we associate with emotions. And then there are higher level emotions, like for example, love. Now, where does the love thing come from? Suppose you have a social system, not only one agent, but many agents, and, and you give them tasks. And these tasks, some of these tasks can only be solved by working together. Because these agents are smart, they learn over time to work together uh, because that's good for both of them. So for, for many of them. So if you give them a task that only one of them cannot solve by himself, uh, they need the help of the others, then suddenly they have an incentive to help the others when the others have a problem. You know? and, um, and we can get all of this in artificial societies of artificial agents. So you get at least the first stages of fear and of love and um, collaboration in as a byproduct of just maximizing reward and minimizing pain, which is something that engi any engineer will implement in his robots just to protect them uh, and to, to make them able to understand what's bad for them and what's good for them and how to invent action sequences that lead to uh, a lot of reward and little pain. So uh, emotion is something that our um, uh, little agents have had for a long time. And this is only, only going to accelerate in the future. At the moment, our biggest agents are really tiny compared to you guys, to, to human brains. A human brain is still much bigger than a big network. For example, a big LSTM network that is used by the platform companies to translate from one language to another, that is maybe 1 billion connections, 1 billion connections. That sounds like a lot, but in your brain, you've got 1 million billion connections. And uh, this means that your brain in some ways is still a million times more complicated, complex than, um, than the most um, successful current networks. However, 
A factor of a million, as we mentioned before, corresponds only to uh, 30 years, because every five years we are gaining a factor of 10. So you can expect that within the next uh, few decades, we will have um, all kinds of superhuman results um, and, um, and it coming up through artificial systems like that. And you will also get the feeling that they are getting more and more emotional as they are approaching what you, are know, what you know from your human uh, colleagues. Wonderful. So we have a 30 years time, <laughs> and then the machines will take over and build up the very complex emotions. And maybe we'll reach to a phenomena uh, which is shown in movie like her, where humans will start falling in love with artificial OS or maybe machines. They will develop some kind of complex emotions. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now, coming back to uh, the, it, the very relevant topic which you have picked up is about application of AI in this uh, currently managing this uh, COVID-19. How do we really combat this uh, COVID-19? And everybody is, is struggling with that. The whole world focuses on coronavirus only. And that's the reason perhaps we are doing this uh, live webinar. Now, uh, one of the major problem with developing vaccine is that uh, the strains keep on changing. The, the DNA structure is keep on changing and, and the scientists are str struggling. Now, we would like to hear your thoughts, which can really give some ray of hope to all the audience as well. Uh, how AI can really help in solving this kind of complex problem, uh, bringing the vaccines much faster into the market. Yes. Um, so I mentioned a few of the possibilities. I mentioned that you can use artificial neural networks to design molecules, um, to design drugs. And how does that work? You have a huge database of chemical reactions and you train these deep networks to model these uh, reactions. So you say, these are the inputs, uh, several substances and certain catalyzers under certain temperatures, and these are the resulting outputs. And then uh, if you have lots of examples like that, for example, Bayer, the company Bayer has millions of examples of chemical reactions like that, the network can learn to become a chemist, basically. So it can learn to predict the consequences of combinations of um, substances and compounds and can predict the outcomes. It's maybe not perfect. Nevertheless, you can use it then and you can say, you can work it backwards. You can say, uh, I would like to have a compound that does that. For example, in the ligand based approach, I would like to have a molecule that docks on this particular um, uh, uh, critical position of the folded protein of the um, coronavirus, uh, or, or one of these proteins of the virus. And what kind of ingredients do I have to uh, have under which conditions to create a molecule that can do that docking, that will do that. And then you can use this network to create um, a suggestion for um, what you can try then in the wet lab. And um, although it's not perfect, it can greatly uh, reduce the time needed to come up with new ideas for the chemists to, um, to say, oh, let's take this and this and this and put it together with this catalyzer and whatever. And then um, uh, let's look whether in reality, you really get the um, outcome that the network predicts. And that's what's currently greatly accelerating these, uh, these trials. So it's not a miracle solution to everything. And maybe it's coming too late for the virus, we don't know. But we already have competitions uh, along these lines. I mentioned the JEDI competition, the European Moonshot Factory, which is trying to, um, uh, to, to, to exploit that. And the winner is going to get 2 million euros. Wonderful. Uh, but is there any uh, lab or any pharmaceutical company currently using uh, deep learning for designing this uh, vaccines for uh, coronavirus, if you're aware of? 
Yeah. So the vaccines for the coronavirus, nobody has one yet. Yeah. But many labs um, are using the approach that I just mentioned. So many of the major uh, companies in chemistry and in drug design have little teams at least. Some of them have, have bigger teams, some of them have smaller teams, uh, trying to do exactly that to reduce the, um, the time needed for drug design. So one can say that in recent years, this approach has revolutionized not only uh, speech recognition and, um, and a couple of other things, uh, but also chemistry. Wonderful, wonderful. There are some questions which is coming from the audience. And uh, uh, there's one question which is, can we introduce AI in operating systems of mobile phone and how it can be done? Well, and you have some AI on your smartphone, um, not necessarily in the operating system, but right. um, many of the apps that you have on your smartphone, they use some sort of AI. For maybe you have pattern recognizing apps, which, uh, which, which you use to recognize flowers, for example, or uh, you have the standard apps that um, are on all smartphones uh, with the Android um, operating system, like the Google speech recognition. So there you have built in um, neural networks that, um, that, that do what you suggest. So. Uh, if you're using the automatic email answering system that has existed in, for Google since I think 2016, something like that, mm -hmm. again, you're using actually an LSTM, an artificial neural network of the type that we have developed at, in Munich and in Switzerland um, uh, to, to generate these uh, proposals of answers to messages by other people. And, uh, and yes, there are already now uh, thousands of apps uh, for smartphones, which are based on this type of AI. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hulgur. Uh, there is another question which has come from Vikram Bansal. Uh, he's asking, do we think we shall reach the singularity? Uh, we talk about AI. Uh, whether we reach the singularity without what? Yes. Do you think we shall reach the singularity? And ah. we're talking about AI. Yeah. yeah. So the concept of a singularity, of a technological singularity, goes back to the 50s uh, when uh, Stanislav Ulam and Jon von Neumann talked about um, their observations. Back then, already 70 years ago, they noticed that um, technology appears to accelerate. So even uh, shortly after the war, this was obvious to some people. And if it is true that the distances between subsequent breakthroughs in technology shrink exponentially like this and then this and this and so on, then even if there are infinitely many breakthroughs, the whole thing must converge in finite time. And they call that the technological singularity. And I learned about that through uh, science, science fiction novels in the 1980s, um, written by Werner Bingey, who wrote novels such as uh, Maroon and Real Time and, um, and similar things. Uh, so he was the one who popularized this concept. And after Bingey, many others also popularized that. So now, um, often people, when they hear this word singularity, they think about this time when a superhuman AI might um, be much smarter than any human scientist. And from then on, everything that's important, um, all of science is going to be mostly driven by these AIs and not so much by humans anymore. And now the question is, um, is that going to happen soon? And the answer is, um, I'd, be I'd be surprised if it doesn't happen soon. <laughs> because um, the universe is still so young and if you, if you look at um, what has happened so far, there has been a constant acceleration of, um, of events um, that are relevant for this development, uh, which not only goes back a few decades or a few hundred years, many people when they think about the singularity, they look at the acceleration of recent developments in the past few decades or so. No, it goes back all the way to the Big Bang. If you take if you take this um, time since the Big Bang, that's about 
13.8 billion years. Now let's divide that by a factor of 1000. So we get a little interval of just 13 million years. Now 13 million years some ago, something really important happened. Uh, the first hominids emerged, our ancestors, 13 million years ago. And almost everything that we think is important happened in these last 13 million years. However, if we divide that again by a factor of 1,000, then we end up 13,000 years ago when something really important happened because back then the first civilization emerged. 13,000 years ago, people discovered agriculture and, um, and domestication of the animals and so on. And, and almost everything that we consider important happened in these last 13,000 years, which are just like a flash like a flash in world history, just a millionth of world history. And the first guy who had agriculture was almost the same guy who had a spacecraft in 1957. So in the very near future, we will for the first time have AIs that in many, many ways are superior to what we have in our brains. And, um, and we already, as I showed you, have, we already have AIs that not only slavishly imitate humans, but also invent their own scientific questions, their own uh, uh, questions to answer, and their own experiments to figure out the answers to these questions, like little scientists. And we already have all of that. So it seems to me clear that within the next few decades, something very big along these lines is going to happen. And that my old dream from my teenager times is going to come true, that we truly will have AIs that, um, that are much smarter than I could ever hope to be. And, um, and then I can retire. It doesn't look like that you will ever retire. <laughs> uh, so there is a very another interesting question uh, Rahul Singh is asking, and that actually came in my mind as well. What was your motivation in terms of really a personal motivation or technical motivation in terms of working on LSTM uh, and uh, coming with this fantastic improved models? What is the motivation? Um, so uh, 30 years ago, uh, people already used neural networks and, um, and, and they tried to solve interesting problems. But back then it was um, very soon, very clear that the big problem is the problem of depth. You couldn't really train deep networks. You could only uh, have recurrent networks that process very short sequences. But our world is full of long sequences. Uh, and that's not only true for speech recognition and translation. Uh, your entire life is a long sequence of, uh, you know, 75, 80 years or whatever it is. And you, you want to use all these experiences in your uh, sequence of events during your life to uh, become a better problem solver. So you have to deal with long um, uh, sequences, you have to deal with deep problems, and then that's uh, the motivation. We just realized um, around 1990, even before that, uh, if that problem doesn't get solved, then AI won't make any prog progress at all. And first I tried to solve it through something called unsupervised pre-training that was in 1990, 1991. And it worked great for certain problems, but then uh, um, with the uh, diploma thesis of um, SEP, fundamental insights came to, um, towards LSTM. And from then on, um, that worked even better than, than the previous stuff. And finally, um, and today it's on your smartphones. So <clears throat> you thought of taking it on unsupervised learning world where the world was actually working and fighting on solving the problems with the supervised uh, learning problems. And that was quite audacious at that time. You took up this challenge and I think the world is being transformed. <clears throat> uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, Are AI used to detect cyber attacks and how efficient also which sort of uh, AI is being used to detect cyber attacks and cyber attacks is becoming uh, much and much more sophisticated and uh, a lot of companies are using AI solutions to detect it. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, Oakland, on that? Yes. <laughs> because that's another big threat to the humanity. Yes, yes, that is a threat. 
And um, what we see in this field is, as always, an arms race, because yes, for a long time, there have been um, uh, groups that try to invade other computer systems and even life critical computer systems. Um, then uh, there were countermeasures, certain companies focused just on uh, trying to predict or to detect patterns in these attacks such that they um, could be uh, identified and blocked before they really happened. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, the other side um, didn't stop developing their own tools. And then they try to use neural networks and certain types of AI to uh, circumvent the countermeasures. And I think as always, it's going to continue like that. Just like humans today are still fighting against viruses, although viruses were invented billions of years ago, right. the fight hasn't stopped. It's just that new tools are coming up today. Uh, civilization, which is a very recent thing, has invented new tools that uh, standard biology didn't have, you know, like for example, genome sequencing and the whole business of medical of the medical profession and and of scientists trying to figure out what is this virus doing and can I quickly um, uh, develop countermeasures and we see um, new tools but the principle is not changing and the viruses are going to adapt in the future to our new inventions and the same is going to be true for artificial viruses in cyber attacks and for biological viruses in biology. So this game will always continue like a good cop and bad cop. So we'll keep no, on the, here. The good cops and the bad cops, that's true. Yeah. <clears throat> there. So I think we have uh, there's a lot of long questions, which are more like a statement than the questions. Uh, now we have very limited time, only three minutes left. Now, I would like you to comment on, since uh, you're a father of modern AI, which are like five things comes into your mind. Because in last two months, all of us, we have been thinking differently about how we have really take up our life and society and business and everything. Which are the five things top of the five, five things comes to your head where we should actually apply AI and where we should do research. And there are a lot of researchers, a lot of students, a lot of data scientists attending this session, where we should focus on five top things. Fortunately, AI is such a broad field that many, many different applications will come out of it and already have come out of it. Which means all these brilliant guys out there behind the screens, I don't want to tell them what to do. They know by themselves what they are really interested in. And some of them are using it for, uh, defeating, for defeating diseases and viruses. And others are using it for making smarter robots that can help humans to achieve things that they couldn't do before. And others um, maybe even use it for building robots that can operate in space where humans are um, not very useful because space is hostile to humans, but friendly to appropriately designed robots. Many of you are going to use it against cyber attacks. Some of you even to improve your cyber attacks. I'm sure some of them are here as well. And, um, and so uh, in the end, the, um, the competition of the markets, but also of the scientists will figure out which of these, um, which of these contributions are really uh, useful and are promising enough to attract a lot of resources for future development. And, and the other things which are side shows, they, um, they will naturally die out as always has been the case in science and in other fields of human endeavor. Thank you so much. And uh, I think we can take another last question. So since uh, you are a father of modern AI, you're leading authority. Now, a lot of our students are there, a lot of uh, practitioners are there, and they would like to really take a cue from you 
how do they really start their journey in AI? Ah, how do you start? You, you, the best thing is to read a couple of things, um, to read the basic papers that have been uh, published over the decades. And, um, and um, often the best way is to start with a, with a survey, but then go deeper. And you soon will, uh, will discover the most interesting areas. For example, people like myself, um, I'm really, really interested in, in agents that are unsupervised and that not only answer questions that they have received from humans, but they also invent their own questions. That's what scientists do. In science, you, there are only two things, invent a good question and find a good answer for that question. And this is uh, this whole business of artificial curiosity and artificial creativity, which I personally believe is going to be the future of true AI, as opposed to applied AI, which is just about solving problems that humans give to the system. But it's not about true AI, which is more about how to build a an artificial baby that later becomes an artificial grown-up scientist and and so uh, it's easy to find um, papers and uh, surveys on that and if you if you want to make a dent read the basic um, uh, foundations of not only of machine learning and neural networks but also computer science in general and there you will get the foundation uh, for making breakthroughs on your own Thank you, Professor Hogan. It was wonderful uh, interacting with you. It was uh, such an intellectual discussion with you. And there's, I think this time is very short, 60 minutes. I wish if we had like three hours or four hours, we could have really discussed so many topics, so many things. And there are a lot of hundreds of questions which in pouring in. But unfortunately, we could not really answer those questions. Uh, and I express my gratitude on the behalf of AGES. Uh, MUNI, our partners AICT and FICI for accepting our invitation and taking our time to address uh, this gathering. Uh, thank you so much. And again, in future, we would really allocate, uh, we'll take your time and we'll ask you to really address for a larger duration of period so that we can take more number of questions. Thank you so much, Professor Urgan, and take care.